Okay, from here we like to introduce Laura McGuire, and she is going to talk about coordination, uh, important for trapeze artists, critical for DevOps squads. Thank you. I'm gonna pop this guy up here. Okay, so thank you so much for the uh, introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, I do have to say uh, Warner, wherever you are, um, gave me a really nice speaker gift, which included like the original like Nintendo game console. And I gotta say like, I'm a student. Do you want me to graduate or not? <laughs> So if I come back here at DevOps Days 2025 and I haven't quite graduated, then you'll know I'll know why. So um, I gotta say, so yesterday we got a chance to chat. We got a little bit of an introduction um, with my Ignite talk, uh, but I feel like I didn't really get a chance to let you know kind of who I am and um, what I'm doing. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time kind of doing that here today. Um, and then also in the Ignite talk, I felt like I was kind of fire hosing you with a whole lot of really high level con, uh, concepts. Um, and I took out a lot of the context for why and how those things are important. So today I'm gonna try and put some of that back in um, and tell you a little bit about what it is about the DevOps domain that's really interesting um, to us as cognitive systems engineers. Um, so coordination is what we are here to talk about. Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about, so I came from, um, before I came back to school, I spent 15 years in the natural resource industry. Uh, so I was doing a lot of safety and quality um, risk management type work within those domains. And of course, these are places where things blow up, things crash, things explode, things leak things go sideways in a very, very big way. So the, the consequences of error, the consequences of uh, poor design of these systems, of um, you know, operating degraded operations, are they're very high and they're very substantial, uh, not only for the people that are, that are around that process that they're trying to manage, but often for our communities uh, at large, environmentally, socially, politically, and economically. So I have done a lot of thinking about risk. I've done a lot of thinking about how work is organized, work is coordinated, and how it is that we can help to support the people that are tasked with managing and maintaining very complicated, uh, very sometimes abstracted and often technology mediated processes. So if you're a firefighter, you get direct contact with the fire. Um, but the things that you do, and increasingly that people like nuclear power plant operators do, even pilots and doctors doing surgical robotics, they are also technology-mediated workplaces. So they don't have that direct contact anymore. So now we start to think about these concepts in terms of, all right, we have another team member in this equation, and it's an automated process. It's a... Um, uh, you know, sometimes artificial intelligence, sometimes it's, uh, you know, automation that helps us to kind of make things more efficient, to uh, reach broader scales, um, what have you. And as we talked about a little bit yesterday with that black box, they are a very silent partner in this kind of uh, work equation. So that's really where some of the crossovers come in for me in looking at high consequence work and looking at sort of improving human performance within these technology mediated worlds. So that is not the only place that I um, think about risk. Um, if you're gonna operate with me here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is another place um, where I spend a lot of time thinking about risk. Um, I am a climber and a backcountry skier and generally, as a lot of Canadians are, just a, an all-around sort of mountain person. Um, and so I spend a lot of time hanging out thousands of feet off the ground, uh, you know, kind of stuck to this little cliff by little pieces of wire, little pieces of gear that you've kind of placed in all the way up. 
And so naturally, risk is very front and center for me in these types of uh, environments. And so I think about how I'm perceiving risk. I think about the tools and the equipment that I'm using to protect myself and my climbing partner. Um, I think about uh, the training that I've done to be physically capable to um, do the, the tasks that I'm asking myself to do. Um, I think a lot about my partner and their capabilities and their limitations, um, and as well as the conditions that I'm in, the mountain that I'm on, the types of hazards that I think I'm going to face. Um, and so there's a lot of, I, I think a lot about the uncertainty that's inherent in these environments and try as best as possible to put mitigations in place for when things go sideways. And it's not if things go sideways, it's when things go sideways. And so I, I'm anticipating that that statement is gonna land somewhat well with you guys here, um, because the types of environments that you are in as well are, they're uncertain, there's a high degree of uncertainty, there's some ambiguity, there's a, a degree of not being able to predict and anticipate the types of hazards that you're gonna face um, when the system goes down. So I tell this story um, partially because uh, Michael asked me to tell a rambling story, uh, but also partially because about five years ago I had an experience that um, really profoundly changed the way that I think about risk. Um, and it, it actually brought me to be here in front of you today uh, because it was, it was inherently uncomfortable. Um, so this is... Mount Abraham, up in the beautiful Canadian Rockies. It's in uh, the David Thompson country. Um, and I, uh, it was probably mid-August, several years ago, that I um, got together with a group of friends. So there was a team of six of us, and we were climbing in uh, pairs of two. Um, and several of the people that I was climbing with, I, you know, had done a lot of different types of trips, both kind of sport climbs, which are a little bit less involved than alpine climbs, which is what this was. Um, and so we were quite familiar with each other, comfortable, knew each other's skills and abilities. Um, and then the other two uh, were... Well, lesser known to us, but uh, still highly credible, very experienced climbers. You know, we, we had spent a lot of time socially with them, so, you know, had a high degree of um, comfort with their abilities. Uh, and so over the course of kind of several weeks, we'd talked about what we were going to do. Um, the original objective that we had, which was about 500 uh, kilometers away from here, I don't know what that is in miles, but uh, it was a long way away from this area, um, had uh, some weather that was moving in, so we kind of had to do a last minute adjustment and pick another objective. And so this was it. Um, and so at that point in time, we, um, we brought, uh, or we checked all of the data that was available about the climb, kind of made plans about our schedule, what we were gonna, uh, what kind of gear we were gonna bring and how we were gonna kind of go about it. So, um, long story shorter, um, we, a series of events kind of slowly changed our plans in real time. Uh, you know, we got uh, one of the, one of my climbing partner's uh, sons got sick, and so we decided to leave a little bit later. Um, you know, we met up with some people along the way. There was kind of an, on, an ongoing kind of slow uh, change to the plans. Um, but nothing out of the out of the ordinary. This is kind of how it goes. You know, you kind of you tuck and roll as things uh, progress throughout the day. Um, but about uh, three quarters of the way through that climb, uh, which was about probably six or eight hours into the day, uh, it became very apparent that we were going to spend the night on the mountain. Um, and so we were prepared for this because anyone who goes out into the woods and who undertakes kind of activity like this um, knows that you're always prepared for that, those kinds of situations, for overnighting. Um, so we had bivvies, we had extra water and food and this and that. Um, and it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. 
Um, the, it was incredibly cold. Uh, you know, we sat on the ridge overnight and shivered our way through it. It was, um, oh man, I really should have done my adaptations before I got up here. It was probably about minus five Celsius. So I'll leave you to figure out what that is in Fahrenheit, but cold. Um, and so it was freezing and it was uncomfortable. You know, we were still tied into our harnesses because you're kind of on a little four foot, foot sort of ledge and we're, you know, crunched up over top of a, a climbing rope and, you know, it's, it's not how you want to spend your evening. But there was also incredibly beautiful northern lights that were happening. So, um, but the reason that I sort of tell this story is because at that time I was a Canadian registered safety professional. You know, this was my job to manage risk and to uh, manage sort of situations so they don't go sideways, so they don't have unintended consequences to them. And I got totally surprised by this. There was nothing, even, even after the fact, when I sort of look back on it, I think, well, these things happened, and these things happened, and these things happened, but nothing was out of the normal of that kind of range of variability that you expect to see in that type of activity. Um, and so it made me really uncomfortable because uh, you know, I at work am telling people, well, you have to do these things, you have to prepare, you have to have the right training, you have to follow the right protocols and the right procedures, and if you do that, nothing is going to go wrong. Um, and yet, I have an experience in which I have done all of these things and still things still went wrong. Um, so it, it led me to a lot more reading and to pulling a lot of threads to find out, well, how are people, I'm, I'm not the only one in these types of conditions, how are people in these uh, very extreme environments or these very high uh, consequence environments coping with this type of variability? And so it sort of led me into this PhD program that I'm in right now, which is fundamentally where we are starting to look at what are the normal everyday operating conditions of work? Not the formal marketing protocols or the, the visible sort of as surface aspects of work that, that show up in org charts and safe operating procedures and uh, you know playbooks. What is the real actual activity that people do on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to make shit happen when things are not predictable and when they are not uh, always uh, easily anticip anticipated? So, um, so I come at this from a number of different perspectives, um, but I think that there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of what I see in your worlds that is very common, and so there's a lot that we, we get out of it as researchers and a lot that we can bring to it um, from things that we see working with astronauts, working with fighter pilots, with military intelligence analysts, nuclear power plant operators, all of these other types of environments where you have humans working with technology in very ambiguous, uncertain, always changing environments. So that was a long way of getting to here, which is uh, the roadmap for where we're gonna go. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes up front here talking about what is, um, what is, the, what is it about the DevOps environment that we get real excited about. Um, and then we're gonna take a little bit of a detour. Um, we'll talk briefly about this connection to uh, other high-risk domains. And then we'll come back to um, coordination. And so coordination, what I'm gonna talk about to here today, uh, as a PhD student, you just get like fire hosed with information when you come into a program. And uh, I was telling my colleague earlier that uh, when I put together this presentation, I was like, yeah, and then I'm gonna talk about this, and then I'm gonna talk about this and this. Um, but really that, that's what I've decided to do is kind of pull back and talk about some specific aspects of coordination so that we can um, just look at one component of it as opposed to um, kind of hammering you with a whole lot, which maybe I'll show up next year at DevOps Days and finish the rest of it. Uh, and then finally, um, we'll come down to what we in Canada call applause. <laughs> so that's where we're going. So yesterday, um, we talked a little bit uh, about the, the environment that you're in, the continuous deployment environment, um, and what that means. 
So continuous deployment implies that there's always change, that there's always variability that's in your systems and that's in your work. Um, and the, the, the fact that, that is, that's a thing that happens on top of this demand for near perfect reliability. So I know you have service level agreements and different kind of objectives that say, well, you know, we, we only need to get 98 point whatever uh, percentage, but the truth is, is that as people start to, um, to need that service, it becomes more critical, uh, that demand, that sort of imply, or the, the actual contract that exists and the implied contract that exists, uh, they start to separate a little bit. So this kind of, this idea that you need to have near perfect reliability and also change while you are also coping with the idea that, hey, things pop up in this world, bugs pop up in this world, um, technical debt is sort of piling up in the background. So you have this, this uh, need for introducing new features um, on the development side of things and this chronic sort of pressure that is asking you to, to uh, resolve these sort of these issues that are there. Um, some of the other features of this world uh, that I think are really interesting is the dependencies aspect of it. So both the known and unknown dependencies that, you know, even if you don't have like a microservice architecture, um, the, the, you're highly reliant on these tools and these um, services to keep your service up and running. So how many of you use Slack to communicate? No, oh, that's not as many as I thought, but so we have um, a tool like Slack, which is a coordinative tool, which is um, enabling you to have very quick, very reasonably high fidelity interaction. And if that's the thing that goes down for you, um, it disrupts your ability to coordinate and to respond to outages or even to, to get work um, done in the first place. Um, so things like your communication channels, your monitoring systems and tools, when those things go down, uh, it starts to change, it creates unintended sort of uh, consequences about how you're going to be able to resolve, how you're gonna be able to detect what's actually going on, to diagnose what's going on, and then ultimately to be able to resolve it. Um, so some of the other things, uh, that, um, that I think is kind of interesting about this idea of, of dependencies is that it's your ability to sort of cope with this degraded uh, performance that may um, happen is that it is increasingly starting to cross organizational boundaries for you. So, you know, some of you are smaller companies, some of you are very, very large um, companies operating at scale, and so you are dependent not only on other departments and organizations within your company, but we're crossing this sort of intra-organizational boundary, and you now have a very critical dependency with some of these um, services. Uh, or these external third-party sort of vendors. So it's really changing the dynamic between um, how you set up work, how you set up these, you kind of coordinate work among these different players. Um, and then as, all, uh, as well, the sort of like the nature of these sort of distributed work teams is that you are pulling expertise from diff different parts of the organization at different points in time. Um, and so the, and then I, the, the last point that I guess I will make on this because I'm kind of fangirling on DevOps right now, but um, is the scale at which you operate. So this is not something that, um, you know, you're all in this world, you swim in this water every single day. And so these things you're like, okay, well, thank you, Captain Obvious. This is like what we do. Um, but it's not inconsequential parts of, of your work. And so the challenges that you face are not things that are, you know, people that are personally um, incompetent or unable to cope with. You are dealing with a very complex work environment. So I kind of, the next thing I want to try and talk about here is like this myth of the fully functioning system um, because most engineers that I talk to are like, they, they seem to think that like other company systems are really like sleek and shiny and they're fast and they're always up and they don't break in weird ways and they don't have like technical debt like 
piled up in the trunk. Um, and that their engineering teams are like super disciplined about like grooming the backlog and, and getting things back on, um, in order. Uh, and so I kind of tend to see this as being like, you know, they're like, oh, it's like everybody else is driving the Audi R8. Um, and it's like this really pervasive sort of feeling. Um, but the reality of what the systems are is like, <laughs> you're kind of a bit more like the chicken bus. Um, and so if you've never like actually seen a chicken bus, like you've never been to a developing country, um, you know, this is, uh, it's, a, it's a very common like mode of transportation. Um, and, you know, all sorts of people use it. It travels long distances oftentimes. Um, and it's called a chicken bus because you are just as likely to be sitting next to like a crate of chickens as you are to like another fellow passenger. Um, so the analogy to the system from the Audi R8 to the chicken bus is that, you know, you're here like tying on all these new features onto the top. You're like carrying around like abandoned baggage from like passengers that got off like miles ago. Um, but, but nobody really wants to take it off the bus because they're like, I don't know, it could do something. So let's not touch it. Um, <laughs> And so you're like bumping along these roads with all the like dents and the cracks in the windows from all the like previous fender benders that you've been in. Um, and you're hoping that you really don't get a flat tire because uh, you like, you know, traded the flat tire for something else at some point in time. Um, and then there's like noisy exhaust in there because of all the deferred maintenance that kind of took place. And so this is kind of like a silly example here, um, but the underlying message is pretty serious because it doesn't matter how great of a driver that you are. Um, if you're working with a chicken bus and not an Audi R8, it's not gonna handle quite the, the same way. Um, so when we start to look at, uh, at, at things like this, at sort of raising up the idea that these systems are not perfect, they're not shiny, they're not degraded, or they're not um, you know, fully functional the way we expect, it kind of changes the way we look at, at human error, and it changes the way we look at the role of the practitioner. And so it's not like, well, you did something wrong and you broke the system. It's that, well, the system is broken and you are keeping it moving, um, and your ability to keep that system moving uh, was temporarily impaired. So we, instead of saying, let's just shame and blame and retrain that person because they obviously did something wrong, we start to look at the broader conditions of work that existed around that, uh, that particular action or decision. Mm. So my colleague, uh, Richard Cook, is like much less dramatic than I am. He's an anesthesiologist, and so he states these ideas much more concisely. Um, and he says, you know, like everything is sometimes broken. Like your customers begin to use your product or your service uh, in ways that you never intended. So now it's kind of operating outside of its design parameters, um, and it breaks. Uh, or something is always broken, so you found a bug and you're waiting for a vendor to fix it and it's taking forever. Uh, and then if nothing seems broken, wait a minute. So the pace of change is continuous, either from those intentional changes that you guys are making um, or uh, unintended sort of interactions and, and uh, cascading effects. So therefore, recovery, repair, and revision is ongoing. So this is the normal state of your system. So one of the other things that is really interesting about when we start talking about systems is the idea of resource constraints. And so this is a fundamental property of systems um, that none of them are unconstrained. So one of the things is like the things that you need to keep your system up and running are valuable. And so, but they're also valuable to other parts of the system or other systems. And so you're constantly engaged in this, um, in this battle to sort of uh, properly resource and, and, uh, and uh, get, your, get what you need for your system, whether that's money, whether that's people, whether that's time. Um, you know, the reason that it's hard to find good programmers is because everybody needs good programmers. So DevOps world, chronically constrained and uh, chronically resource constrained.
So another aspect of this is this idea of multiple competing goals. So we have this idea of like both local and sort of global goals and no two parts of that system are going to experience an outage the same. And so for you, if you're on the, um, if you're on trying to resolve the uh, issue side of things, you might say, you know what, I'm gonna let this play out a little bit longer uh, because it gives me more information to uh, find out what's going on within the system. Um, but if you're on the, I need this to be able to do my work uh, critically, get it back up as soon as possible, um, those are conflicting goals that we are constantly managing within organizations. Um, so trade-offs, you know, this kind of the goal conflicts start to allude to the trade-offs and this is another fundamental aspect of system properties um, is that because resources are constrained, those trade-offs are necessary. And so you can temporarily relax these trade-offs by adding resources to the system or moving them around, but you can't actually avoid them forever. And so these things are like a very real and very present part of everyday work for you um, and of normal operations, but they're not quite as visible as when uh, something, they're not quite as visible as like the human actions and decisions that get made on a day-to-day -day basis. And so once something happens, it becomes pretty clear what the right choice to do was. Um, but the sort of the challenges and the constraints and the variability that you were coping with in that moment in context just kind of disappears into thin air. And so sometimes the stories that we can elicit after uh, incidents or after outages um, are very superficial and they don't reflect the true nature of the, um, uh, of the work. So here's the pit stop um, and I'm just gonna Michael Where's my goal? So I am running longer. You're okay with this? All right, how much longer do you? I'll keep going. <laughs> no problem, put you on the spot. All right, I'll tell you what, you can give me one of these like when you're ready to have me wind up. So this, the pit stop here is that like when we start talking about, um, you know, about these like extreme environments, like sometimes we get a bit of pushback and people are like, okay, easy, you know, like this, we're DevOps engineers, we're not astronauts. Um, and they're like, it's not really relevant or they're too extreme or like we don't operate in zero gravity. Um, and, but the, the, I really wanna reinforce the point here is that the unit of analysis is, is not, doesn't have to do with those things necessarily. It has to do with how people cope with complexity and uncertainty in, in very dynamic worlds. So your tools are different, your tasks are different, your goals are different, but the processes that you are using um, to navigate, uh, you know, landing a 787 at Shiphole Airport, um, or performing emergency open heart surgery, um, or, well, okay, this guy kind of looks like he's just like out for a jet pack joy ride in outer space, <laughs> but I'm sure he's doing something really important. Um, you know, these are technology mediated, rapidly changing, resource constrained, time bound, goal conflicted work environments. And so when I realize and when we collectively as a field realize that more and more of our critical global infrastructure like 911 routing systems, electronic health records, you know, stock exchanges, air traffic control systems, banks and so on are becoming increasingly dependent on modern digital services, then I would say it is pretty darn important that we study DevOps engineers and we figure out the ways to support you in being able to get those systems back up and running to the same extent that we look at outer space exploration. So this is very serious work that is worth very serious study. But let's go to the circus, because why not? So I have to be honest with you, when I set the topic for this top, I was like kind of being cute with the whole trapeze artist thing. But then I like went down this YouTube rabbit hole looking at like videos of like trapeze artists and um, it, it was, I was kind of regretting it because I was like, okay, you know, trapeze artists are way cooler than DevOps engineers, I gotta say that. <laughs>
So, but the point here is that we coordinate with each other every day, both explicitly as in a trapeze act and also implicitly, kind of similar like you did with the other drivers on the road when you were getting here today. Um, it's a salient example of something that is, appears quite simple on the surface, um, but is actually like quite a, a nuanced and deeper phenomenon. So looking at you, I got a two minute video. Do you want me to skip it? Let's go with it. All right, so engineers in the room, they're always usually really good at this task. Um, there was a, uh, well, you know what? I'm just gonna play it. You guys will roll with it. You'll figure it out. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So it's true. It is easy to miss something that you are not looking for, uh, which is why I really like this idea of like looking at coordination, because we have this kind of idea of like, well, it's just there. We just do it. Um, and going deeper and really understanding that this is a necessary requirement for any competitive organization that's out there. Um, and in DevOps, like there's a, there's a number of reasons why parties might work together. You know, there's necessity that like, uh, you know, I don't know how to do that thing and you know how to do that thing, so we need to work together. Um, you can produce better things when you work jointly, collaboratively. Um, you, it, it can be quicker to work together. Um, and sometimes we're just more capable of a broader range of possibilities um, if we do work together. So with the complexity and the sort of the change that's always ongoing in modern digital systems, it requires that, you know, we talked about this yesterday, sort of bringing together those multiple diverse perspectives um, so that we can converge that knowledge for the purpose of detecting and diagnosing and intervening within, uh, within an outage. Um, and so the, the coordination here sort of serves as a bit of a protective mechanism to safeguard against um, further failures and to mitigate their impacts, but also to preemptively identify other exposures and opportunities um, and to develop new features that can enhance uh, the capabilities of the users. So uh, as modern architecture is like synonymous with like highly interdependent networks, coordination therefore like happens across a really broad um, range of individuals, like within teams, across teams, and in different parts of the organization. Uh, and then as also, as I mentioned, across like organizational boundaries. So these sorts of things are requiring us to coordinate, to organize in new and different ways that we, that traditional businesses may not um, have had to. And so we have seen the rise of like modern tooling, things like IRC channels, alerting and paging systems, um, and video conferencing that kind of allow us to have these distributed work teams, uh, but still functioning 
um, in a very real way uh, at various scales and various tempos um, to be able to sort of like rapidly mobilize at the earliest indication that something is wrong. Um, and it allows us to kind of easily draw in those resources that we need to delegate work, to um, update response team members on the findings from investigations or, you know, different kind of lines of inquiry, and then resynchronize those efforts and minimize lag during redirection. Um, so, So I'm going to make this a bit more tangible um, in an area where uh, coordination is critical for DevOps. And I've, I've been talking a lot about outages because that's really what I've been studying. Um, so bear with me. Uh, so this is like an oversimplified uh, example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about coordination here is that, you know, you may have some users that are identifying that something's wrong in the system to uh, an SRE or to some, a service owner um, at that point. And then that person and might need to coordinate with those multiple diverse perspectives to bring together those various like mental models that we talked about yesterday. Um, and then there's levels of coordination that happen internally with the team. What do you know? What do I know? What's the status of this system? How do we bring all of this together in a very coherent fashion? And then, as I mentioned, you might need to um, reach out to other parts intra or inter-organizationally, the network team, what's going on. Um, you might need to bring in a third-party vendor. They might need to bring in another third-party vendor. You might have an executive that's calling you up and being like, what's going on? When are you going to be back up? Um, so there's a lot. And then you might need to be organizing and coordinating through all of those different teams. And so I know that like some of you might be saying, like, oh, we have an incident commander. That's what the, they do in these sort of emergency response protocols. Um, but the, think back to like what we just talked about with that sort of vis visibility or sorry that variability and that degradation within the systems and those constraints that disrupt these everyday best laid plans we had a plan going up the abraham shoulder it got disrupted so what happens when the plans get interrupted uh, from a coordination perspective um, Yes, so, and this was just to say that those are in different levels of the uh, inside the organization and outside the organization. So some of the uh, foundations for coordination here, it seems pretty obvious to say, but there needs to be an intention um, that we're going to work together, that, that implied level of commitment to support the processes of coordination. Um, and the reason why this is important is that coordination costs like, yeah, there's a financial cost around, um, you know, purchasing certain levels of reliability with your SLAs or with your vendors, um, but it costs in terms of if I am going to interrupt my um, immediate goals in order to uh, join in resolving the broader organizational goal of getting the system back up, um, I am incurring a cost to my own work and benefits there. Uh, and secondly, there's an interdependence element of it. Um, and so that is uh, kind of implied a little bit as well in the sense that um, the work that I'm doing is interweaved and intertwined with the work that you are doing. And this is actually quite a, um, quite a difficult element of work when we look at these environments because sometimes they interact in ways that are not, in, not very visible right up front. So um, some of the other requirements for coordination is predictability, um, common ground, and directability. So from a predictability perspective, just as the sun is going to rise every day, so do we, do we need to provide assurances to those that we work with that um, if you break down or if you have an issue, I'm going to be um, to uh, assist you with that and I'm going to get that reciprocity back if I, um, if I have issues down the line. Um, and the reason why that predictability is important is that um, the, you know, if you have a user that opens a JIRA ticket because they're experiencing issues with your, uh, your service, uh, but then they, can't, they don't get a response from that, they're going to show up in your workspace and tap you on the shoulder or start pinging you on Slack or, you know, on IRC. Um, and that kind of disrupts your flow. That breakdown in coordination um, has other consequences for work as well. So common ground can be kind of thought of like being on the same page. Do we share a lot of the same values and same goals around um, working together? 
Uh, and then direct ability is if I'm engaging coordinated work with you, uh, I have to be willing to allow my activities to be redirected or directed by someone else um, so that you know, we can achieve these, these broader meta goals and the purposes of shared activity. So um, interpredictability, just looking for Michael here, waiting for the, yeah, okay. Is that a, okay, all right. Um, so I, I, I spent a lot of my time up front kind of talking about like the, the aspects of the DevOps world and so it has kind of like crushed me into this part talking about um, coordination. So I'm gonna power through these next couple of slides so that um, we can move on. But I will, you know, these will be posted uh, to the web but I did really want to um, get this in front of you guys to be starting to look at the things that you are doing are not uh, inconsequential, the, the work that you are doing is challenging, it's difficult, and it's challenging and difficult in ways that are not always um, quite visible. So I think that's really important for this domain to recognize. So whether you are, I'm gonna hop through that, apologies. Um, so the, the kind of aspects that I want to really uh, drive back down in, co in coordination and, you know, I'm summarizing a talk that I did not really get through, but um, when we look at coordination, establishing that foundation, really making sure that our sort of mental models are aligned as much as possible, um, being mutually predictable, understanding that uh, the, that coordination of work in these really high tempo periods um, needs a degree of uh, uh, that commitment to the common goal, uh, being mutually directable, uh, being able to organize our work activities in ways that, um, that meets those meta goals, and then maintaining common ground, constantly resourcing and rechecking that our mental models are aligned um, and that our work activities are pulling in the same direction. So thank you for your patience with my, um, time, my timing <laughs> issues here, um, and I really appreciate your attention. Uh, thank you very much.